I think we all realize that the study of any subject by means of that instrument which it is itself the subject of the study presents certain very definite difficulties. The mind of man is able to distinguish many things but has never yet been adequately able to distinguish its own essence. Man has greater trouble understanding himself than he has in seeking out the answers to other questions. Always, therefore, when the individual turns upon the source of his own faculties in an effort to discover their meaning or their substance, we must use these faculties to explain themselves. And this mostly cannot be for the reason that faculties have a kind of motion. And that motion is from themselves toward other things. To reverse this motion and turn the faculty toward itself represents a very difficult and for the most part unsuccessful venture. Therefore, when we come to the problem of consciousness, we are seeking to understand a power or energy that we commonly use, that is available to all of us that has become a familiar part of our own existence. If there be a consciousness separate from this kind of consciousness, and we assume that there may be, then this also is difficult for us to understand. For we are conscious of consciousness only as we experience it. And by this experience, we discover it as an energy or power by which we may know certain things, by which we may motivate certain actions, by which we may comprehend or conceive on the level of idea. Consciousness has something to do with memory, something to do with thought, a great deal to do with understanding. Yet, although we have coined terms for all these functions of a luminous energy within ourselves, we have no adequate means of discovering the substance and nature of that energy. We assume that at death, the individual is separated in some way from body, or his consciousness ceases to function and that therefore the state of inanimation, which we call death, would represent the suspension or separation of consciousness from a body. We are not even certain that this is true. But we assume, therefore, that consciousness has to do with animation. And from the word itself, we suspect a relation to the soul or the psychic life of the individual. We like to assume, furthermore, that consciousness is that part of our nature which is most true to ourselves, most nearly to being, most near to being our real existence. And by extension, because of its luminous and wonderful power, we further like to assume that consciousness is like God or that God is manifested as consciousness, and that the consciousness in man is a God power, a divine element or energy available to man in part, available to the universe in its total existence. Thus consciousness we conceive or sense as being a vast area of self-knowing, 
a vast area of energy by which things become aware of themselves and of each other, by means of which the knower or the conscious being becomes aware of nature and of the universe and of the infinite diversity of manifestation going on constantly in the world around us. Studying this term of consciousness, however, we come upon a number of other elements or factors which have to be considered. Assume, for example, that consciousness is universally diffused through all things. Yet in this universal diffusion of their superior part, all things are not equal. Therefore, the consciousness in the plant is in some way different from the consciousness in man. The consciousness in the atom is different from that of the consciousness in the animal. Thus, consciousness, though infinitely diffused, is not in some way infinitely equal in manifestation. If consciousness is a reality, is a total life principle, if all things participate in it, we should then wonder why all things are not the same, and how it happens that the consciousness of one individual comes to different conclusions about many problems, or faces life in a different way from the consciousness of another individual. We must come to the conclusion, therefore, that there is not only something universal about consciousness, but also something particular. That this term as we use it, perhaps, is unwisely or unskillfully applied. It may be that the word consciousness has come to have a meaning that is not inherent in the energy which we are seeking to describe. For certainly, Consciousness in different persons leads to different acceptances and rejections. Even if we wish to regard all of these as equal, we must still face the problem of infinite diversity or difference. Therefore, consciousness is composed of an infinite number of different aspects of itself. This presents a very difficult situation again to rationalize. We might assume that if consciousness is the divine light in man, that as man unfolds, he would come to certain common agreements, that he would have certain common consciousness experiences. To a measure he has, but not to a sufficient degree, to fully justify our acceptance of our own definition. We may assume, or should be able to assume, that a number of persons, all of about the same degree of social, racial, cultural background, should have comparatively identical points of view. This they do not. We might also assume that genius, or the development of hyper-individuality, would lead to some penetration into common consciousness. This is not true in most cases. In fact, we begin to recognize the importance of the individual, the individual being a separate point of view, and that perhaps we need individuals more than we have suspected. And what we call conformity, in which we all come to common conclusions, may not be as desirable or as much a symbol of advancement as we have generally supposed. Thus we have this one life in us, this thing which we call consciousness, producing an infinite diversity of personal equations each one distinctly separate, each one in some mysterious way an individual, 
and we discover that if consciousness is universal in one aspect, it is utterly individual in another. And that consciousness is a universality of individuals or individualities. And that wherever we turn, we find forms of life unfolding consciousness according to need, according to attributes. The Greeks took up this problem and came to the conclusion that difference was not a matter of consciousness but of psychic emphasis. According to them, man's consciousness differs because of the vessel which contained it. The individual's personality, his body, his emotions, his lower mental equipment, these were the differentiating uh, factors. And one consciousness, moving into an infinite variety of personalities, became interpreted or defined according to these individualities rather than according to its own nature. Therefore, it was the mind that made the individual, not his consciousness. And the concept of the Greek was that what we term consciousness was universal and mind was individual. Thus, as man's body is personal, separate from all other bodies, his mind is individual, capable of an existence independent of other minds. But his life is not individual. His life is universal, utterly dependent upon one source of life. And to the ancients, this life and life source were the fountains of consciousness. For to them, consciousness was life itself. Assuming this as a tenable idea, we must still, however, face certain confusions. Because actually, life or consciousness is a power superior to mind. It seems strange, therefore, that mind can mold consciousness, uh, can limit it, restrict it, or prevent its proper expression, or can cause it to come to error. Whereas it might be more reasonable to assume that consciousness would be ever modifying mind and that consciousness itself, being stronger and more universal than mind, would early in evolution achieve a conquest of consciousness over intellect, and that therefore man would be constantly under the dominion of his consciousness rather than his thoughts. Yet consciousness and thought are in conflict in many instances, and up to this stage in our evolution, thought has more frequently won than lost and consciousness has nearly always remained the victim of the intellectual and emotional pressures of the human being. Psychology may say that consciousness is therefore mind and pressure. It is mental, it is emotional, it is all these things. Consciousness is therefore simply an animating principle capable of being involved in innumerable complexities and not capable, actually, of dominating any of them inasmuch as consciousness, as we please to call it, is the product of life rather than the cause of life and that the education of consciousness is essentially the reason for existence. Now, this viewpoint, of course, is contrary to your older classical opinion. For in your classical system, man as a spiritual or enlightened being had an existence prior to man as a relapsed or benighted creature. Man falling into generation fell from a divine state into a mortal state by means of which his inner consciousness was obscured and he became the victim of appetite pressures and desires. Liberation, therefore, was the release of consciousness from involvement in desire. It's restoration by discipline, by renunciation, by the gradual separation of man's integrity 
uh, from the restraint placed upon it by his environmental life. It was nearly always a series of ethical compromises. Here again, consciousness assumes an interesting but rather confused position. Man attempting to restore consciousness finds himself, for example, in the Greek philosophy, in the place of a savior of his own consciousness. Instead of consciousness, which is his divine nature, rescuing him, he must rescue consciousness. He must make a voluntary restoration of it, which would seem to imply that whatever consciousness is, it is not capable of an immediate and instantaneous transformation of anything dissimilar to itself. Man is not thereby a, a directly rescued by consciousness, but must preserve his own integrity and earn the right to possess what we might term enlightened consciousness. Consciousness is therefore a recondite. It is hidden. It is something that must be earned. It is a reward. It is something which will not achieve its own immediate freedom, but must be freed by something else. This, again, is quite contrary to the attitude that we commonly have that it is omniscient, that consciousness is absolute and ultimate truth. If consciousness in man existed in a state of natural and eternal truth, how could any lesser part of man exist in a state of delusion or error? It isn't a case of where man has to rescue himself. If consciousness is the total of himself, if it is the mainspring and energy of himself, if it is his over-self, his all-self, and it is true, and it knows, and it is perfection in itself. How can man linger in any other state? Why is he not immediately absorbed into this completeness which is the root and life of himself? If consciousness is deity, and this deity abides in man, why does not this deity fulfill man? bringing man into a state of identity with itself by the very virtue of itself being in man and forever operating man. The uh, medieval scholastics attempted to create an explanation of this, which they uh, formulated under the doctrine of original sin. Uh, they conceived that in some way man had set up an interval between himself and deity or consciousness. That man had been disobedient. By disobedience he had broken away and destroyed the harmony between himself as a creature and the creator whose energy reposed within him. Thus man had to mend this wickedness before he could be restored to the grace of God. This mending was repentance. This mending was a restatement of individual integrity. This mending was the voluntary acceptance of the will of God and the voluntary relinquishment of human will. The circumstances of this original sin differ in many religions, but it is present in several of them. Among the more philosophical systems, the idea of original sin simply gives away to the processes of evolution in which life, absorbing itself into matter, enters into a state of conflict with its environment. And this conflict must continue until the victory of life over matter that life and matter are thereby in conflict. But even this is difficult for us to understand. For if consciousness is all there is, and is eternal, and is inevitable, and is all-knowing, with, with what can it be in conflict? How can there be 
a conflict between complete consciousness and any other state, presuming there can be any other state. For consciousness, being total, would be totally capable of understanding. And can we be in conflict with anything that we totally understand? And uh, philosophy is inclined to question that, assuming that nearly all conflict that we can recognize arises from lack of understanding. Also, can we be in conflict with that in which there is no secret or no mystery? Most of our difficulties arise because we do not uh, have a knowledge of the internal lives of other things. We do not experience their true motive. We do not understand the burdens or the responsibilities which influence their actions. If we had such understanding in total, would it not be more likely that we would be sympathetic rather than critical? Therefore, that conflict again would be less and less probable. Also, where consciousness existed, there could be no ignorance because there could be no, nothing unknown. And if there is no ignorance, no superstition, no doubt and fear, we would be living in a very different world from the one we now inhabit. Yet consciousness remains as having an existence of some kind. And it has always been assumed that at the root of life there was an all-pervading omniscience and all-knowing, and all-being, and that this consciousness uh, was the diviner part, the inner part, the nobler part of creatures. This brings us to our particular problem of the evening, which is to try to estimate a term which has come into some usage, the term the pre-conscious. Here again, we are in a very rarefied atmosphere. But let us try and see what we can do with it. A, situ a condition, an energy, or a state must either be always and forever the same, or it must be in a state of eternal flux. Things are forever alike or they are forever moving from one likeness to another. We go back to our Greeks again. If consciousness is eternal, it is forever the same. If consciousness is not eternal, it is forever different. Those are the rules by means of which it has to function. For a thing which has not a conscious eternity in its nature must move from a previous to a subsequent condition forever. Moving forever from what it has been through what it is toward what it will be. And if a thing is not always alike or always the same, then what it has been, what it is, and what it will be must always differ. Our rule further tells us that in a universe of orderly procedure, such as we envision to be our own, a motion from a previous to a present to a future condition must always be a progressive motion. Therefore, unless consciousness is omnisciently and omniactively always the same, it is forever moving from a lesser condition of itself toward a greater one. In other words, it is growing. It is either eternal or it is growing. Now, if it is growing, it is in the infinite state of becoming, a becomingness that goes on beyond our ability uh, to conceive or understand. It is difficult for us to assume that a becomingness goes on forever without an achievement of becoming. This is another very difficult thing for us to understand. But our philosophers have pointed out that this state 
a forever becoming in which the fullness or completeness has not yet been achieved and theoretically may never be achieved, being always a state of becoming, that each now in that, each moment under consideration is a total state of becoming, so that the individual who lives now has very little sense of his own shortcomings. He can conceive of how much less he once was by looking backward, but he cannot look forward. Therefore, he cannot know how much more he will be. That every moment, therefore, man feels in intuitively that he is the master of the ages. He is the greatest thing that ever has been at every moment of his destiny. But tomorrow he discovers he can be greater. This situation leaves him comparatively comfortable without the need of a finality upon his own growth. Assuming that consciousness can be a condition of becoming, that it is a state of perpetual and eternal unfoldment of potential, that it is like a stream flowing from an ancient fountain and flowing down through time and eternity until it fulfills its incredible, immeasurable destiny. If such is the situation, then we must assume that at any time consciousness is the consequence of something and is in turn causing something else as a consequence of itself. Thus the term pre-conscious is man's effort to discover the nature of the consciousness of yesterday, the consciousness before it is now. The individual trying to work with this experience of the consciousness before it is now runs into an immediate problem which helps perhaps to clarify the whole issue. The moment he tries to think back as to his consciousness yesterday, he must do it with his consciousness of today. Therefore he runs into a peculiar dilemma. He cannot be what he was yesterday. He can only contemplate it in the light of what he is today. So he can never fit himself into the consciousness of his own past. Once it is gone, it can be restored by memory, revitalized, but not re-experienced. It is like pain. Once it stops, you cannot feel that particular pain again. But you can certainly remember how much it hurt. But you cannot revitalize the experience of that pain. Even the neurotic person cannot quite make it, although some of them uh, do stupendously well in their effort to recapture it. If then we are to re-experience the state, we will say, of ourselves 10, 15, 20 years ago, Something has to happen first, and the thing that happens has to happen first is that the consciousness of ourselves now must be blocked, or we cannot do it. If, therefore, we are approach it on the basis of hypnotic regression, putting the now to sleep, refocusing, refocusing the individual upon a time gone by, and causing him to relive that time, we may cause that individual to reactivate a pattern of consciousness that is dead, that is gone as far as objective awareness is concerned. When we do this, we cause this per person who is now the adult to revitalize and completely re-energize the state of their own childhood at a given time. One of the most common being a birthday party of 20 or 30 years earlier. 
the child can be caused to be again rescued out of the adult, proving that this previous consciousness did not actually die but was submerged and is no longer available as itself in the conscious state of the individual. Only when the new consciousness, the consciousness of today, is blocked can this old consciousness uh, be revitalized. Now, tests have been made of this particular type of regression, and an interesting point has been noted. When you regress an adult, say, to the seventh year, and give them careful psychological testing during the regression, you discover that you cannot regress the child, uh, we will say, to the seventh year. You can revitalize the incidents of the seventh year, causing the child to live them. But the child will live even those incidents with a slightly greater maturity than the original seven years would have justified. So if you regress the child to its seventh year, it will interpret its seventh year experiences with the mind of an eight-year-old child. There will be one year additional growth that you cannot block. This is an interesting point because it means that even in a regression, and even though the conscious mind of the day is asleep, there is a certain subconscious growth that cannot be prevented and which continues to accumulate gradually in the course of 20 or 30 years, the difference of approximately one year in the patterns will be noticed. It comes around, however, that the reason why the past is no longer to be normally re-experienced is because the point of awareness has moved away from it. And the point of awareness is normally always contemporary. It is always focused on the now because it is the association mechanism moving from within the individual which binds him to the present environment, the present consideration, and the testimonies of the present sensory reflexes. By action, man is bound to now. And it is only when in some way he is artificially uh, prevented from continuing his present focus, that he enters into a state of pre-focus or pre-consciousness. Now we can also say, supposing that we did block this individual, supposing we block his present consciousness entirely, so that he is not aware that he has any existence whatever and we give him no directive. We don't tell him anything. We simply give him a non-directive for objective function. Things heard, seen, known in his daily life are separated from him by a suspension of his external sensory faculty and the suspension of his ego function. If we do this and leave him alone, we will have no report on him, whatever. He will not register anything. He will remain in a state of apparently dreamless sleep. And he will remain in that state until he is awakened. If, therefore, we simply block the now, the individual does not automatically fall into any other time pattern. He doesn't fall into yesterday or tomorrow if you simply block now. If you block now, he simply falls asleep and stays there. If, however, you block now and regress him 
you can recapture any part of his life up to the moment. If you block now and attempt to progress him, however, into a future state, you are again blocked. He has not the capacity uh, to achieve a condition not experienced. So one of two things will happen. Either he will still remain asleep, or you must create for him a future. Then you may cause him to visualize it or enter into it. If you wish to define for him some utopian dream that you expect will occur in the future, and you tell him that he is living in a city of gold, and that everybody is happy, and uh, give him sufficient directive, he will see and report what you have told him, living in exactly the kind of place you have created for him. But he has no normal instinct to create such a place for himself. Because the moment you have suspended his objective consciousness, you have suspended also his regrets about the way things are or his wish to change them. These are very tricky uh, equations, but they do tell us something if we really want to, to study them. If then we take away from man his objective awareness, we do not immediately give him subjective awareness. If we block out the consciousness of birth, he is not immediately awakened in heaven. If we take away from him that which is familiar, he simply sleeps, proving apparently uh, that he is bound only to the familiar, and that the moment we depart from that which is experienced by him, or can be experienced by his sensory perceptions, he ceases to function. This brings another interesting equation into the problem. What happens, or what conceivably could happen, if a a person under hypnosis could be induced to dream. Now, here would be an interesting problem. Now, he can be induced to dream because the operator can cause him to internally visualize or experience whatever the operator desires or gives in the form of a suggestion. The person will experience these things and report upon them. But of his own accord, he seems less likely to sleep than he does in normal sleep. Something has happened in connection with his psychic pressure load and the psychic pressure load which causes dreaming seems to be suspended by the hypnotic procedure. It, was that, it is therefore necessary to direct the hypnotized person into some reflection or into some channel of action, subjective action, if you wish him to experience it. Of himself, he will not experience it. Also, when the time comes for this person to reawaken into objectivity, it is possible either to block the side of life which has been under the hypnotic somnambulism, so that the patient has no memory of it, or it is possible to leave this gate of memory open so that the individual will remember. This becomes a matter of decision and uh, presents another interesting phase, namely that whereas in ordinary dreams the natural tendency is for the dream to fade away in the objective state of awakening, except in a very few extreme cases. In the case of hypnosis, this can be, con this can be controlled in such a way that the individual's awareness uh, can be directed by the operator into memory or lack of memory, as seems to be most desirable. 
In analytical work, sometimes lack of memory is very important because otherwise the person is too rapidly burdened with too much of an unloading of his own psychic nature, which has to be carefully avoided. Now, what has all this to do with the problem of consciousness in one? It has this to do with it, namely that the sleep center, when it is controlled, or the individual is caused to enter into the voluntary state of unconsciousness, actually is no longer aware of any objective circumstances going on around him, nor is he aware of his own actions during hypnosis except by permission of the operator. But now we have this point. He can be caused to remember or not. Therefore, actually, we have this situation. Supposing a person under hypnosis is told not to remember. Five years later, the person is placed again under hypnosis and under the hypnotic condition is permitted to remember while again hypnotized. He will remember. This can then be again blocked before awakening so that the individual ultimately can, at discretion, prove that they have two systems of memory operating simultaneously and completely separate from each other, so that a continuity can be set up either in the state of hypnosis or outside of the state of hypnosis, and these two memories will carry on and never meet unless the operator wishes them to me. Yet he can bring them together at any time he wishes. Under such conditions, it is evident that in hypnosis that there is a kind of consciousness that will carry on from one uh, experience to another. Therefore, the man potentially has more than one memory system, a subjective or subconscious memory system and a conscious memory system. And both of these systems are not only operating during hypnotic problems, but are constantly operating in the normal so-called experiences of life and still do not meet. But man has therefore sleep memory and waking memory. He has a kind of memory which records psychic pressure night after night through dreaming without that pressure ever being faithfully reported objectively. So that this psychic pressure can be uh, a cause of reflection, thoughtfulness, fear, doubt, worry for a lifetime without ever coming through into the consciousness of the individual as a conscious memory. It means, of course, that under such conditions, uh, ventilation of this psychic pressure is usually in sleep in the form of dreams. And these dreams can be consistent for a lifetime without the waking person being aware of the continuity of their meaning or the pressures which they are seeking to release. Yet these dreams themselves indicate a complete subjective continuity and a deep laid plan that is going to fulfill itself in some way. Free consciousness therefore implies several things. It implies the problem of the emerging of the conscious life of man at birth. It implies the problem of the re-emergence of the conscious life of man from sleep daily. It also has a larger universal implication in the emergence of the consciousness which we call man from a pre-conscious state in nature. Furthermore, it challenges us with the fact that man is a manifestation of some kind of an energy that is everywhere resident in space, and therefore that the pre-conscious state of man 
probably must correspond with a universal space which still surrounds man and also affects the numerous creatures around him in nature. All of these points lead then to this consideration that consciousness as we know it is a condition, a state, a degree in the unfolding of something. And that this thing that is unfolded emerged from a previous state, which was the seed or root of itself. And that this previous state may or may not clearly resemble or be recognizable in the terms of the condition which emerged from it. Thus, for example, if man saw only an oak tree and was never aware of where the oak tree came from and never saw the growth of an oak tree, there would be no rational procedure in the world that could convince him that it began with an acorn. It simply would be impossible if man himself did not know through experience and observation that such is the case. Because the acorn is not in a way understandable or acceptable as the source of a great tree uh, many thousands of times the size of itself. Also, therefore, in terms of consciousness, that which is pre-conscious may in no way resemble consciousness as we know it, and yet may be capable of containing it, engendering it, causing it to emerge from itself. Also, is consciousness itself fruitful? Does it in turn bear a kind of fruit by means of which other forms of knowing or being or existing may be engendered or caused to come into manifestation? Some of your Eastern philosophies assume that the, the entire universe is composed of nothing except conditions of consciousness that there is no such a thing as consciousness and something else, that there is only consciousness, that matter is a kind of consciousness, that mind is a kind of consciousness, that stars and elements are kinds of consciousness, and that actually that this one energy in its infinite manifestation is all that exists and all things are modes of it in varying degrees of the unfoldment of one of the eternal essence. These Indians, of course, then also take the ground that space itself, which is the great field of consciousness potential, consciousness in its most abstract form, has within it an infinite seed life of its own nature, and that these seeds are forever growing, bursting into life, gem generating, germinating, uh, so that there is an eternal harvest of creation, existing forever, rising from the substance of the uncreated self. That everywhere in nature, consciousness is blooming from its own root, blossoming forth and bearing its fruit, and as Plotinus explained it, it was a kind of mysterious flower with its root in heaven and its branches downward and its blossoms in the experience of man. This type of thinking perhaps supports the idea also that consciousness is a mystery which must forever be the quest of man until it is explained. The finally, existence has as its primary objective the solving of the mystery of consciousness. That all things that happen are indicative in some way of the great riddle or its solution. That man's completeness, that man's journey ends only with the 
solution to the mystery of consciousness. If such may be considered a possibility, we are now dealing more or less with a valid school of thought in the Far East. What then is the ethical implication? What is the discipline involved in this thinking? The discipline involved is the effort of the individual to have the experience of pure consciousness, whatever it may be, that it exists that the only possible way in which man can solve the mystery of his own existence is to solve it with pure consciousness. And that the only answer to all things rests in the consciousness which causes these things. Unfortunately, however, this is not quite as easy or obvious as might first appear. As far as we are able to observe in nature, most things that happen occur without the causes of themselves being obvious. Man is not aware of the reason for himself, even as he causes his own kind to exist. And we are not so positive or not so certain that any creature, by the mere will or desire, can solve the mystery of its own causation. Nor can we be certain that any creature is fully and completely aware of the reason for itself. The Greeks, again, were of the opinion that the reason for creatures must always be deposited in superior creatures. That it is only in the divine nature that the reason for man exists and therefore that man cannot solve his own mystery. That all he can do is to seek a reunion with the divine nature in which all mysteries are solved. Other systems of thought, for instance your Vedanta system, approaches the subject of total consciousness uh, with another kind of attitude. And in this, we can also find uh, some justification for the Buddhist idea of nirvana. At first thought, uh, the individual attempting to establish pure consciousness or unite himself with pure consciousness is simply casting himself into oblivion. In the Eastern concept, the individual must completely cease to be in order for universal consciousness to be restored to its own eternal rulership over things. There was a conflict between mortal mind and divine mind. And in this conflict, mortal mind must voluntarily surrender itself. And in the voluntary surrender of itself, must sacrifice all of its own objectives, including its own sense of self-awareness. Thus, Western writers, trying to make commentaries upon these Eastern religious classics, have uh, scratched their heads a bit and have come to the conclusion that these old systems are Asiatic nihilism, that they are simply the complete extinction of the individual, that the only peace that man can know is by ceasing to exist totally. This is not actually the concept of the Eastern thinker, however. The Western man, it probably would be uh, the likely explanation. Western man, to whom motion and action are extremely dear, could not conceive of the suspension of his personal desires and attitudes and anything remaining. In the East, however, it is an entirely different perspective. In the East, the idea pertains that it is possible for the individual uh, to completely overcome that interval of not-likeness by means of which things are separated from other things. That man 
dropping into the abyss of his own internal, rejecting by degrees every testimony and function of his sensory perception, detaching himself from every object of mental or emotional life, may finally fall into a complete suspension of the element of illusion in his own nature. Having reached the point, therefore, where everything that is not so has ceased, he stands presumably upon the threshold of that which is so, and makes another interesting discovery. In his vocabulary, in his thinking, in his mentation, he has never yet devised any means of communicating the nature of that which is so. He has wonderful ways of explaining what is not so. We can share our ignorance with gallantry and ease. In fact, we preach it continuously to each other. We can also have the most learned discourse upon trivia at any moment. We can go on and on, elaborating upon our mistakes, our shortcomings, and our weaknesses. We can spend a great deal of time deciding what is not true. But when it comes to a positive statement, of that which is unconditionally true. We have nothing to say, because we have no word, no thought, no idea with which we can grasp it. We have lived always in a kind of dream, a kind of nightmare. In the course of ages, this dream world of our objective senses has become the reality. We have grown so accustomed to war that the one thing we can't define is peace. We can't really experience it because we do not know what it is. We have great difficulty even in trying to explain a little personal peace. It's very hard. To us, a peace is merely the least degree of stress. But the total absence of stress the total positivity of complete peace is beyond us. And when many people think of it, they think of it only as inertia and total boredom. We have no positive concept of these things. So if in the Buddhist thinking we come finally to the total suspension of everything that is not real, including that part of ourselves which is not real, which Buddha says is the sense of selfhood. What remains? How shall we define what is left? How shall we explain immortality? How shall we assume the state of man after death? In what way shall we explain anything? The Egyptians pointed out that the state of man after death is due largely to the intensities of his condition during life here. The Tibetan in his bardo, or the ritual of death, helps or seeks to help the deceased person to orient himself in another world which is startlingly like this one or to help him to find an immediate and fortunate re-embodiment back again into this objective world of condition that we know. What would we do with the problem of trying to define a kind of world, a paradise, a heaven, or an inferno, in which a group of absolutely desireless beings continued forever. We just cannot imagine it. We have already populated the other world with all kinds of incidents and personalities and conditions and circumstances derived from here. <coughs> Apart from what we objectively and subjectively experience, we have no answer.
philosophy, it was clearly pointed out that this total suspension was not extinction, that it was not the end, that it was not materialism, that it was not nihilism, that it was the invitation to the first experience of what we call consciousness and know nothing about. In other words, we have a polarized state, a state of consciousness and unconsciousness, and we have reversed them. What we call consciousness, the ancient sage called unconsciousness. What we call waking, he called sleeping. What we call our daily objectivity was his nightmare. Plato pointed out that heaven is not the place, uh, the hell is not the place where you go when you die, but when you are born. Everything is reversed. But what we call consciousness today is really the conflict, the pressure, the stress, the irritation of factors uncontrolled, undirected, unmastered, and therefore out of conscious direction. That instead of being conscious today, we are the victim of a series of sensory cycles, mistaking reflexes for consciousness, mistaking notions for consciousness, and depending entirely upon opinion to supply the substance of what we like to call knowing. As a result of that, what we call knowing is unknowing. What we call wisdom is truly the foolishness of God. What we call progress may be motion or commotion in any direction, whatever, because we have no visual or vital concept of what direction progress should take. Thus we assume that all motion is the sign of life, and if there is commotion with it, then the individual is really alive. <laughs> On the basis that commotion is the proof of animation, we are going along very well. But if we are to assume that there is purpose in any, then are we doing so well? And if we have no awareness of purpose and have no strength of character by means of which we choose to protect value at all costs, if we lack these uh, strengths within ourselves, are we conscious? Or are we merely uh, responding to the pressure and stimulation of sensations. Are we really conscious beings or merely sensory beings? Most persons are probably mostly sensory beings because if you block the five senses completely, they would have very little record to tell or very few experiences to report and not very many opinions to circulate. Our entire so-called awareness is based upon our ability to contact a series of environmental circumstances. Our opinions are derived from the papers we read, the television programs we listen to, the neighbors who talk over the back fence. All of these things arise from outside of ourselves and become the basis of our internal reaction to things. Thus, we have two kinds of an outside life. One case, one kind of life, which is outside in the sense of outside the body. The other is an outside life inside the body, but outside of consciousness. Thus, what we call our inner life is merely our external environmental life flowing in through our sensory perceptions and loading us with confused testimonies of one kind or another. 
Against this procedure, we have little or no motion from within ourselves of a true life or a consciousness. We might say, we probably should say, that without consciousness we would be unable to record these external factors. That means, however, that we are using consciousness only as an energy, using it as we would electricity, as a blind force, merely a servant of certain purposes of our own. The Academy of France decided that there were two kinds of electricity, that which was intelligent and that which was not. And what we call consciousness today is probably mostly a phase of energy which would be compared to intelligent electricity. Consciousness now merely supplies us the energy by means of which we can arrive at certain conclusions or perform certain actions. The motivations behind these conclusions and actions being sensory and bodily and not arising from consciousness itself. If this be true, the average person has had very few examples of consciousness in his lifetime. He has not experienced uh, the pure control of his life by internal value alone. It is not certain that he would know how to define consciousness if he experienced it. Perhaps the mystical experience would come somewhat near to it. But consciousness is certainly a moving from within the individual of a solutional energy. A, an energy which solves or completes or apperceives these things which are otherwise merely intellectual and emotional forces. Who the hell this to be inevitable? That what we know as consciousness is not. And what we aspire to conceive of as consciousness, the real, is a positive whole, as yet practically unknown to man. But this consciousness is known to man only in one respect, namely that it manifests as the fact of his existence, which is the only fact that he possesses. That consciousness as he knows it may be at best merely a capacity instead of being something which we have developed until it is really almost superhuman. It is a capacity. It is something which says to us in some way, you can understand if you want to. That there is within you the potential power to know that in some mysterious way you can be. But having the power to know, we do not know. Having the power to be, we doubt our own exact existence. Consciousness is therefore a kind of capacity. It shows that in some way man is capable of achieving to a state of reality. Consciousness is therefore both the capacity for this and the reality to be achieved. It might be philosophically sound, therefore, to think of ourselves not as conscious beings, but as beings groping for consciousness which some way permeates us and fills our existence, yet with which we are not in rapport. It is as though we were a kind of fish in an ocean of life, and yet unaware of this ocean, that we are in the midst of an unreality, or we are in the midst of a reality, but live a total unreality. 
that nearer to us than ourselves and every part of our nature is an all-pervading potential. And yet this potential has not been able uh, to cause us to achieve to any particular state. Yet this potential may bestow upon us certain things. One is continuity, that behind the generation of species, behind the fact that man simply is a creation which has refused to die, that in this alone is a continuity of life which is rooted in consciousness, a consciousness of life that is stronger than death. Another possible phase in which consciousness may be dimly recognized by us is this subtle but continuing urge within us to be better. This sensing of our own in unlimited capacity. That in some way we are using consciousness without knowing it that we are assuming that there is no horizon to limit us but our own achievement, that we can be anything that we will to be, do anything that we will to do. Somewhere in the root of ourselves there is the archetypal impulse that we should will to do that which is so, that which is true, that in our questing our final search must be for value for that which is so. And this recognition that some way we have the capacity to find what is so, and that we consist of an immortal essence that will continue until this victory is achieved, perhaps these sleeping elements of conviction within our own nature, but partly expressed, but partly articulated in living, may be pressures from this positive pole of consciousness. In psychology, for example, we have a subconscious and an unconscious as divisions of the internal life of man. We differentiate these from what we call the conscious. But it is my suspicion that we have made a complete reversal. But what we call the unconscious is on the outside rather than the inside. That man actually moving inward moves toward consciousness and not away from it. If this be potentially true, then some of the choices of our modern aphorisms will have to be revised. Because if the pressure is on the outside, rather than on the inside, as we have been affirming that it is. Then what we need is discipline on the outside rather than relief. We, we have an elaborate problem here that goes into a great many phases of human life. But the actual answer seems to be that psychology up to the present time has never yet dealt with the plus qualities. It has never dealt with that which is the root of things. It has never assumed that the root was the reality. It has always assumed that within man is locked a mass of unreality. That is true to a certain degree. But we must penetrate those unrealities, which belong essentially to our objective lives. For these unrealities arise out of our mental, emotional stress. They do not arise from spiritual value, nor do they rise from consciousness, but rather from the deformities of consciousness on the level of sense and emotion. The search inward, therefore, must go past this, must go past this mystery that the magicians and Kabbalists of the Middle Ages called the mystery of the astral life this mystery of illusion, and must go further in search of that which is pure, positive consciousness. In this, perhaps, 
free consciousness and perhaps even beyond archetypes which up to the present time has seemed to be the direct emergence of consciousness. I think we may go on, as the Buddhist has pointed out, to the discovery of pure consciousness as absolute suspension of action, with the absolute suspension, therefore, of all polarized existence and all time, space, distance equations. If, then, we do approach the ultimate nature of consciousness, we are likely to find it a Lao described in Dao, namely a totality, a something into which everything is finally absorbed, a something which is this eternal capacity, forever devouring its own offspring, as Cronus devoured all his children. In this sense also, we can understand perhaps how the mystic in his search for consciousness has therefore passed through the search on the level of clamor, as search as the search on the level of glamour also. He is no longer concerned with trying to adjust himself to environment. He is seeking to adjust himself to principle to cause within himself, realizing that if he can do so, he can never be out of harmony with environment. But some way, all problems have to be solved somewhere within the field of consciousness. There are no problems to be solved in the world as we see it. There are no problems that can actually be solved on the level of emotion and sense. All problems have to be causally solved and have to be solved as experiences of conscious awareness. If to achieve this end, then, the problem of the retiral of the individual toward samadhi or toward the nirvanic state has been not only the teaching in the East, but in your Christian mysticism, the same idea, the same basic detachment from objectivity in the search for consciousness. Now another point has come in where we have to realize that a term like consciousness may also go into theology and be changed into something else. Your Christian mystic, and I'm thinking of uh, several outstanding examples, perhaps St. John of the Cross is uh, as good an example as any, your Christian mystic has always taken the attitude or the opinion that there was a mysterious power in space which he called the grace of God. This is a mysterious something, a kind of baptism, a magnificent and mysterious water of holiness, something that came to man out of the infinite, and of which apparently he had little understanding or true insight. Yet coming into the presence of this thing, he was completely and entirely altered, picked up, lifted out of death and of doubt, and by this peculiar kind of grace became radiant with the love of God and with the realization of eternity. Now it is conceivable to us that this so-called grace of God, of your Christian mystic, which is to be discovered only when man has transcended this world, that it is this in a way in which he has attempted to explain a dimension of consciousness uh, which otherwise cannot easily be explained. Also, we realize that the so-called miracles, particularly such miracles as those performed at Lourdes, do not represent a merely intellectual approach toward religion. Thousands of pilgrims reach Lourdes for health every year, 
only a small percentage are actually or is actually cured. But this small percentage represents a group of persons to whom a particular experience has occurred. An experience of such tremendous intensity of some kind that it has broken through a pattern of common attitude and belief. Your Eastern and your, old, your early middle will take the ground that this experience arose from the complete detachment of the individual from worldliness. That in, in some mysterious, sensitive way, the world died in man. And that in this moment of complete suspension between heaven and earth, man became aware, perhaps, or cognizant of the fringe on the vestment of consciousness. The consciousness begins, actually, where what we know as living ends. That it is not to be confused and is irreconcilable with the kind of life that we know. That it remains always within itself. That it is a kind of sea from which all life comes and to which all life must return again. For if life had an origin, it arose in consciousness. If it has a destiny, that destiny must be its return again to consciousness. Now, the question that we asked earlier this evening, if consciousness is a certain kind of positive attitude, how is it that man could ever descend from a perfect state into an imperfect one? This question must be answered by another question. Does consciousness, in its own nature, represent this all-knowing state? Is consciousness that kind of an awareness? The evidence of nature is that this is not. That consciousness is not the kind of thing by which all things are filled and therefore becomes a positive energy by which all forms of life can be directed. Consciousness, apparently, as Buddha and the Vedantists and Taoists of all sense, is total life in total and eternal suspension. Therefore, it has to be total life with total suspension of will. Hence, consciousness must be total life without purpose, yet capable of fulfilling the purpose that can arise in the unfolding awareness of all creatures. Like a dark earth into which a thousand different children can plant a thousand different seeds and in which each of these seeds will grow, consciousness must be an infinite capacity in which all things are possible. But this possibility must arise from the experience of living things rather than be imposed upon it, upon living things, by consciousness itself. Therefore, the actual fact of consciousness is that it does not move, nor does it lead to motion. It is rather the end of motion. And that which is united with it becomes immovable. And because it is without motion, it is, with, it is eternal. And because it does not move from one state or condition to another, it is unchangeable. Thus, by degrees, as we take away from the concept of consciousness all that limits, all that cannot be truly adjusted to our even our immature idea of what totality could be. By degrees, we strip away from consciousness all illusion, all delusion, and all error. That which remains, remains undefinable. But it does have a complete freedom from all of the terms and attitudes with which we are familiar. Thus, in the ancient idea of things, Tao, or consciousness, 
in its true sense was this great ocean into which life returned. It was this tremendous cup that captures and holds life. It is this wonderful sea, this ocean, into which all life flows from innumerable fountains and rivers, and the sea remains unchanged and immovable. Now in Buddhism, if life theoretically moves from this state of ignorance along the path of discipleship and liberation, until finally, through the total suspension of error, it reaches this tremendous sea of life, merges itself with it, and vanishes like the drop of water returning to the great sea. What then follows? Buddha does not tell us in his discourses, but he implies and intimates certain things. He said to his disciples that he did not answer these questions because the answers are not profitable. He said, I know many things that I have not told you, but to tell you will gain you nothing and only lead to abstract controversy over subjects about which such controversy cannot be meaningful nor profitable. But this he does say definitely, that we are not to assume that this reabsorption actually means extinction or the termination of the vast motions and processes of life in nature. What he seems to be trying to tell us, if we can read between the lines, is that actually his fable or his analogy is based upon the same idea as that of Plato and the race that lived at the bottom of the well. It's supposed to have been the fable that there was a whole race of creatures that lived at the bottom of a hole in the ground. And these people wrote books and became very learned and wrote and described the universe, just how it was made and everything and explained that the universe was the hole in which they lived, that there were no other holes, and that there was no other place in space except their hole, that they all lived here together, and that the entire knowledge of the race, of the world, of everything, was contained in this hole in the ground. Well, after a long time, there was produced out of this gray race of people living in the bottom of the well, a one daring soul who was able to notice that far up above there was a little patch of light coming down. And they told him that this patch of light, of course, was God. And that therefore that all you did to it was worship it. But this fellow kept looking up and watching this patch of light. And he saw that at night it disappeared and things like that. And he began to get very interested. And at last, he gained the courage to climb up the side of the wall of the well. It was a very difficult journey, but he ultimately achieved it, and finally came to the edge of the top of the well and looked out upon the world around him. And he saw mountains and plains and people and animals and birds, and he saw grass growing and flowers and rivers and all kinds of things, and he suddenly realized that there was a great world up here that no one previously had appreciated or understood. So he hastened down the well to share the good news with all his friends below. They pronounced him mad and refused to even climb the well and take a look. And when he insisted upon this procedure of going around and telling them about what was happening up above, they finally decided that he was not only mad but dangerous and it was up to them to uh, confine him and make certain that he no longer perverted the public morals of the people living at the bottom of the well. And the story apparently is a clever takeoff by Plato on the trial of Socrates, the man who dared to take a look over the top of the well and see what was going on in the larger universe. The analogy to consciousness, I think, is this. 
that what we call living, what we call consciousness today, is the common conviction about value of the people living at the bottom of the well. Somewhere along the line, great prophets, messiahs, teachers, sages, and saints have dared to climb the wall, or have climbed the wall, taken a look around and come back and told people that that is not the way it really is. These saints have all, of course, been regarded as neurotic, or perhaps as mad, and when they were too successful in describing the situation, they were conveniently executed for the protection of their fellow men, lest others take the delusion. Thus, by degrees, we have locked ourselves in the bottom of the well, destroying everyone who tried to bring us out. In our personal lives, we have locked our consciousness in the bottom of the well of our sensory perceptions, our environment, our traditions, and most particularly of authority, which has been the deciding of our minds for the minds of others. Out of all of this situation, we have a new concept of consciousness, or rather, in this case, consciousness is the way things are outside the well. If then we go up to the top of the well, finally, and take a look around, we come into a world that is totally different from anything that we have known. We cannot go back and explain it, because those who live at the bottom of the well have no words or thoughts suitable to understand what we have seen, because they have not seen. But this is not where the analogy ends, and Plato very astutely pointed out the next point, namely, that when man's own internal energy, by the mystical experience, are able to contact the world above the well, or outside the well. And this experience returns again to the sensory factions of man's nature. His own emotions, his own thoughts, his own mind cannot accept or understand. They cannot find the symbols necessary. Therefore, the individual returning from an experience of that kind cannot record it to his own consciousness or his own personal life. He does not know how to bring this experience through to his objective awareness. Thus, a pure experience of consciousness probably could not be remembered because it would not awaken any association mechanism by which it would be tied to the presently familiar. Thus these ecstasies described of the saints and the mystics have always been something exceedingly wonderful. That's all. Something about which there can never be any clarity of explanation. Once also the individual who lives down in the bottom of the well climbs up to the surface and comes out of the well. As far as the people on the bottom of the well are concerned, he is gone forever. He is dead. He has ceased to exist. He has gone forth into a non-existent place, which means that he has to be a non-existent being to function. No one ever expects him to come back, and he probably does not. But not for the reason that is assumed. Not because he does not want to come back, but because he has found a larger world and prefers to function there. In the experience of consciousness, it follows that once the being attains to this consciousness, attains to the nirvana, which is to reach the surface of the ground and look out. For those below, it is the end of everything. He's gone. For himself, it is the beginning of reality. For he has just found out the fact. And somewhere in the compound psychical equipment of man, there is this point where man departs from the error and discovers the fact. Just where this point is, 
remain psychologically obscure. We do not know. But this tilt from error to reality is a larger difference than we have imagined. Reality is not just our present illusions with some minor reformation. It is not just one more percent added to the 99% of what we know now. Nor is it a shuffling around of these existing factors into a new pattern. According to the ancients, consciousness, when it awakens, is an instantaneous and complete transformation of everything. Everything moving from death to life, from appearance to fact, from the things as they seem to be to the eternity of thing as it is, and what appears to be and what actually is. These are so different from each other that we have no cognition of it. <coughs> we are still hoping that we are going to gradually push our way along the line of science, discovery, and art, and all these subjects, and that we are pushing our way into the presence of truth. That one by one, our mistakes are disappearing, and our virtues are multiplying, our abilities are intensified, and we have made this mar marvelous and magnificent thing called progress, and that at almost any minute now we're going to wake up in the millennium. We've always had that feeling, but for some unknown reason the millennium has been a little slow in appearing. And at the moment it does not seem as close as it did last week before the Lebanon situation got quite as tense as it is now. <laughs> Just about the time when it looks like we were really arriving, we invent something else. I have to start all over again to try to put the world back in order. Actually, there is a question as to whether we'll ever win this day. Actually, the probabilities are that the fact of the matter is something that we will never collectively obtain in the common meaning of this word. There will probably never be a day when there will be a mass exit from the bottom of the well, when everyone all at once will say, let's go. <laughs> in the first place, there are a lot of people who do not want to leave the bottom of the well because it's cool and damp down there anyway. <laughs> of course, they may have pneumonia most of the time, but still they've grown accustomed to it. Next thing you might say is that it is cozy down there. <laughs> everybody knows everybody. Everybody has the same fault. Everyone is proud of them. Another thing about it is that there's a potter and exchange system down in the bottom of the well there that has been working for a long time. And there are all kinds of wonderful institutions like prisons and poor farms and wonderful pension systems and all kinds of things down in the bottom of the well. Excellent police systems, fire departments, and of course, regular clinics for the psychoanalysis of individuals who would dare to try to climb out of the well. <laughs> so who wants to leave such a delectable place? However, in every generation, as has been proved in history, there are some who are born with adventure in their hearts. They simply cannot conform. They are born that way. It means that a certain maturity of consciousness is beginning to manifest itself. They are still part of this mystery at the well bottom, but they are rebels against it. And we find the non-conformist. We find that individual who is sometimes called the crank that makes the world go round and takes the crank now and then to do it. So we have the free thinker. We have the non-conformist who becomes an object of some concern to others. Therefore, they are rather happy to see him depart on his long journey and they hope he will not come back. To him, it is an adventure. To them, it is a well-justified punishment for the general attitude that he has taken. 
he climbs out of the well by degree. But this is not going to be a common motion because it means to separate oneself from authority, from tradition, from ancient policies, and from immediate, immediate profit and advantage. The individual who is so short-sighted that he can conceive mostly of his standard of living today only, and would rather perpetuate all of the misfortunes of his race than hazard, is of no move to climb out of the well. So only the occasional person does. But some way those persons live and have become the great leaders of our race. For it is necessary occasionally for some prophet even to return to the well and die there in order that those at the bottom of the well should know about this other world. I think Buddha to a measure did this because I think he was one of those who was able to have the awareness of consciousness by seeing the world of reality, no longer Mars, mountains and gardens and valleys, but the realization that what we call consciousness is not a miraculous or incredible thing. It is simply man climbing out of unconsciousness and coming into a world that has always been there, and the world that he really belongs to. A world that is perfectly natural and normal, something that he has never known. Because there is nothing that he is experiencing now that is either natural or normal. But he doesn't know it. His miseries have become normal. His catastrophes have become natural. The uncertainties of his world have become acceptable. I read not long ago a rather important modern book which simply faces the fact that we might as well face it. There will always be wars. There will always be crime. Man is built that way. So that is the attitude. These things we accept as normal. We regard peace with certain uh, misgiving, perhaps it will represent a depression in the long run because there won't be enough market to get rid of our surplus. Peace is not what we are looking for. We are looking for immediate convenience and comfort and security, but we will, ha we will hazard security to retain advantage. Thus, all this world with its education and its arts and its sciences all this is some way not consciousness. It is not real. It isn't an illusion in the sense that you can put your finger through the middle of it. It isn't there. It is there. But it is illusional in the sense of value. It is an illusion as the men in the bottom of the well are to the person who is no longer there with them. It is the proof that we can make things that have no value so important to us and hold this attitude for so many ages that we become incapable of conceiving of anything more important. But once consciousness comes out, or the being comes out of the well, into positive consciousness, what kind of a world is it going to be? Is it simply going to be a reformed world of our own? Probably nothing even resembles it. It is going to be a state that we cannot adequately define. Probably bearing no resemblance to anything that we know at all. But it is a state of truth, of fact, of actual validity in which things that now hope, fear, believe, and doubt come to a state of knowing. Knowing being, in this case, the factual participation in a conscious reality. You may find that in that state, that, as some of the Eastern felt, the consciousness absorbs us. We become parts of it that only consciousness itself goes on. 
And that this consciousness that goes on is normal, see, is real, and is eternal. And therefore, that when we come out of the hole and come into the gardens at the upper end of the well, we come into an eternal state. A state which is, however, eternal and timeless both. In which there is no sense of it, but an eternal now. Perhaps memory and thought, as we know them, will no longer exist. Perhaps uh, sensory reflexes will have completely ceased. We will have an entirely new structural nature with which to respond to impulse. All of these things seem conceivable. And in this, we go back or go forward or we go toward that which preceded our present state and from which in some mysterious way we departed. How did we get to the bottom of the well in the first place? Were these creatures engendered there? Probably not. They don't tell us in the story just how they got there, but we can take some isolated cases for instance, some of our Western Indian tribes have decided to make their homes 4,000 feet down in the Grand Canyon or something of that nature. Why did people go down in the well? Well, perhaps for protection originally. Individuals seeking protection nearly always exterminate himself, like the Chinese who built the wall around China to keep everyone else out and all it did was catch them in. Then, another thing, perhaps a man fell down the well at some remote time. Or perhaps uh, in some very ancient day, there was a migration down the well to explore it. There was trouble getting out again, and after ages, men gave up trying to get out. Perhaps this is also the story that is behind the fall of man. But the human being, because of body, which is the well in which he is caught, and because of the exigencies of survival, fighting against the saber-toothed tiger, fighting against the tremendous forces of a prehistoric world, where man was nothing, and the animal creation around him was monstrous and horrible. The very processes of survival, the creation of the stone axe and the cave, the discovery of fire, all these ancient problems kept man very much occupied. He was struggling to survive physically in a world of mystery. Perhaps by the time he got this survival partly worked out, he had forgotten that once upon a time he had crawled down the sides of the well. He was down there now, locked into it by the very thousands of years in which he had struggled merely to keep body and soul together in this world. He had no time for reflection. No time for dreams and ideas. By the time he had the time, he had lost the inclination. He was lost within a pattern from which he must extricate himself in some mysterious way. It would be interesting, and I think quite conceivable, to assume, therefore, that this pre-conscious world, this thing which preceded consciousness as we know it, is true consciousness. What we know as consciousness is not consciousness at all. It is simply man's aggregate of awareness faculties by means of which he reacts to environment. None of these faculties can react to consciousness because they know nothing about it. Therefore, the inner life of man, when he turns in toward himself, is just the darkness. His faculties cannot explore it. Therefore, he does not know how to get out of the well. Even when he wishes to and turns within himself, he finds only mystery and darkness. That was the reason why the ancient peoples began uh, their tremendous sense of discipline. Visualization, the gradual transference of certain centers of value from the outside to the inside began this process of helping man to move in some way toward consciousness. The refinement of his values, the greater enrichment of his internal life, 
is seeking more and more on the inside and less and less on the outside. Actually, it was his way of climbing the wall of the well. For in man's case, he must climb this wall by going into his own thought. For somewhere at the top of his own mysterious well, there is this bright patch of light in the sky. And this bright patch of light, which he sees from below, he calls spirit. But this thing that he calls spirit is the light, the sun, the natural luminance of another kind of condition, of which he is not aware. So in climbing toward spirit, he is climbing toward light or the normal and proper light of a real world, a world in which the things which interest him now would appear only as madness or nightmare. He cannot know what he's going to find there, but he may have the same experience as the man who climbed the well. He may discover that what he finds is merely a tremendous distance to be conceived, to be understood. But it is not a problem in which he is going to have to fight or defend himself. He is merely going to have to be amazed, to be uh, surprised, to suddenly realize that this is the world that he always dreamed about. That here is the world in which the things that are meaningful in his few enlightened moments are truly significant and truly real. Therefore, that in this case there is no adjustment necessary other than the adjustment arising from the effort to climb the well. But by degrees, the individual who makes through his journey, who suddenly resolves to find out the source of himself, the reason for his own being, is the one he ultimately escapes into consciousness. And by attempting this journey, he finds that he comes merely into the light of day. And he comes into an ordinary world. He comes into the normal universe. And to him, is incredible. He discovers that heaven is nothing but the normal universe. That it is the thing as it is, rather than the thing which he has forced into a deformity. That so-called immortality is his natural state, not something that he must fight desperately to attain. There is nothing between him and all of these things except the courage required to climb the well. The ancient systems of initiation and instruction were dedicated to giving the individual the courage to leave the world of darkness and of dreams and seek the world of light and of waking. And to awaken was the ancient symbol of the dawn of consciousness. Man awakens out of matter into consciousness. And what he calls the consciousness here in the state of matter is an awareness, but not a consciousness. Some way this awareness is rooted in consciousness, but not adequate to direct him without inspiration, without guidance, without benevolent leadership from more enlightened uh, teachers and guides. But in all cases, what we are trying to do is to discover a superior state of consciousness, which may lead to health, may lead to many other things. Its complete acceptance is beyond us at the moment. Its complete experience we cannot now have. But if we accept the philosophy that this concept is essentially true, then we can begin to loosen the bonds which bind us to sensory orientation and escape by degrees the tyranny of attitudes and authority, the despotism of darkness, and we will slowly develop the adventurous insight which will lead us to climb out of the well. These things come to us from thought and meditation and reflection. And before we can make the journey, we must suddenly or in some way convince ourselves that this consciousness is not what we have now, but what we might have were we able to complete the journey of life. 
Thus, this consciousness to which we seek to return was that which was before the present state. It existed long before the people fell into the well. And it will exist after the last person has climbed out of the well. The world of the well is an incident. But the great world of life, which contains many wells, is a reality. A man moving up to it suddenly comes into normal, suddenly comes into common sense, value, and reality, and purpose. These are the elements of a very great drama that the ancients unfolded to us. I guess we'll have to leave these elements for the moment and come back to them again next week, so it looks like time is up. <laughs>